All right, we're going to call to order the September 10th, 2018 Royal Oak City Commission meeting to order. We're going to begin uh, with an invocation given by Commissioner Lavasser, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand if you can. As, as we gather here tonight on the eve of the anniversary of the September 11th attacks, let us reflect upon the significance of that day for our nation. Let us remember those who lost their lives in New York, Washington, D.C., and Pennsylvania. Let us appreciate the sacrifices of the public servants who put themselves in harm's way to serve their communities. Let us salute those in our military who left their families and loved ones to travel overseas to bring to justice those who perpetuated the attacks upon us. And let us recall the sense of national unity and purpose we felt immediately following that day. Let us never forget the tragic events of that day or our feelings that followed. Let us instead remember and draw upon those memories to strengthen us as we strive together, united, to make for a more perfect union. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have a couple proclama proclamations to give tonight. The first is going to be a proclamation designating September 2018 as National Recovery Month. Uh, the second proclamation uh, is going to be designating September 2018 as Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And I believe we have Diana Bunchu here. Hi, Diana. First one I'm going to read is the proclamation designating September 2018 as National Recovery. Whereas substance abuse, substance use recovery is important for individual well-being and vitality, as well as for families, communities, and businesses. And whereas opioids were involved in 42,249 deaths in 2016, and opioid overdose deaths were five times higher in 2016 and 1999. And whereas one in five teens abuse prescription drugs before the age of 13, and whereas according to the Centers for Disease Control, in 2016, there were 2,347 Michigan residents that died from drug overdose in Michigan. And whereas we will continue to educate and raise awareness of the risks and potential harm associated with prescription <laughs> drug misuse. And whereas we believe everyone facing substance use disorders deserves the benefit of recovery, and whereas Friday, September 21st, 2018, has been designated for Oakland County's 11th Annual Substance Use Recovery Celebration and Walk, and whereas stigma and stereotypes associated with substance use disorders often keep people from seeking treatment that could improve their quality of life, and whereas substance use disorders occur when the recurrent use of alcohol and or drugs causes clinically or functionally significant impairment, such as health problems, disability, and failure to meet our major responsibilities at work, school, or home. And whereas substance use disorder recovery is a journey of healing and transformation, enabling people to live in a community of his or her choice while striving to achieve their full potential. And whereas substance use disorder recovery benefits individuals with substance use disorders by focusing on their abilities to live, work, and learn, and fully participate and contribute to our society, and it also enriches the culture of our community. Now therefore be it resolved, I, Mayor Fournier, and the members of the Royal Oak City Commission hereby proclaim September 2018 as National Recovery Month and call upon our citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses and schools to recommit our city to increasing awareness and understanding of substance use and the need for appropriate and accessible services to promote recovery. And I'll present this one to you. And I'll also, you want me to do this one right now too? Sure. Okay. So we have the proclamation designating September 2018 as Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Whereas more than 41,000 people die by suicide each year, whereas anyone can experience suicidal thoughts regardless of age, ethnicity, or gender, and whereas individuals with mental health disorders such as depression, anxiety, or post-traumatic stress disorder are at increased risk of suicide, 
And whereas suicide is preventable by learning and noticing warning signs, dispelling a common myth that if someone really wants to die by suicide, they will. And whereas warning signs of suicide include talking, writing, or thinking about death, increased alcohol and drug use, impulsive and or reckless behavior, dramatic mood swings, and social withdrawal from the community, friends and family. And whereas we believe one of the largest barriers to preventing suicide is to cure the negative stigma associated with mental health disorders. And whereas negative stigmas associated with mental health disorders discourages individuals from seeking the help they need and creates the environment of shame and fear. And whereas using social media and community connections, we can educate the public about available resources as well as how to recognize warning signs of suicide. Now therefore, be it resolved, I, Mayor Fournier, and the members of the Royal Oak City Commission hereby proclaim September 2018 as Suicide Prevention Awareness Month and call upon our citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses <coughs> and schools to commit our city to breaking through the negative stigma associated with mental health disorders, allowing individuals to seek treatment without fear or shame, and to raise awareness about the warning signs of suicide so we prevent it. So thank you for these proclamations. Um, I think what we've all seen with either suicide as well as um, the opioid epidemic is that it does cross um, across socioeconomic, religious, and cultural, and genders, right? It can happen to anyone. So what we do believe is that suicide can be preventable or is preventable, and so we are making efforts and working on a zero suicide policy. And we also do believe that recovery is possible. So with getting education out like this, the um, Recovery Month celebration, we believe that we can, along with you and other uh, community members, can make that possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, this brings us to item number six, which is public comment. A few uh, discussion points before we commence public comment. Uh, the City Commission values and relies on the input of our fellow citizens to make decisions. Now is the time set aside for the public to address the City Commission on any city-related issues, both on the agenda and not. I ask that comments be directed to the City Commission as a whole and not to individual commissioners. If you wish to speak tonight at public comment, please wait until recognized by me, the Mayor, come up to the podium. Uh, for the record, we do ask you to state your name and address, and be mindful that the City Commission does wish to hear from everyone who wishes to speak tonight, so there is a timer at the podium uh, to help you keep track of your time. Uh, we do limit comments to three minutes or less. If you don't wish to speak tonight, don't hesitate to reach out to any of the City Commissioners here or myself, uh, a lot of mediums to do that. Um, please note the City Commission will not respond directly to questions during public comment. However, we are taking notes and will address the questions when the agenda item is discussed. And if the topic isn't on the agenda tonight, uh, we'll refer it to the proper city department. Um, and our city manager, I can tell you, I peek over and make sure he's not playing solitaire. He is taking uh, really good notes here, and he does follow up on issues as needed and as appropriate. So with that, uh, who's first? Sir, in the front. Thank you. I was hoping this would get me called on first. <laughs> In the past few meetings, you've talked about cancer a little bit, and uh, I was thinking about it a little bit. September is Cancer Awareness Month for a lot of different cancers: childhood, gynecologic, blood cancers, leukemia. Sir, you just have your, your name and address for the record. I'm so sorry. Didn't I say that? No, we missed it. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Lou Fleury. Thank you, Lou. 1516 North Maple. I was going to remember that, too. <laughs> it's all right. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, uh, Awareness Month, September, childhood cancer, gynecologic, blood cancer, leukemia and lymphoma, ovarian, prostate, and thyroid. And uh, 18th of September is also Take a Loved One to the Doctor Day. But uh, I, th I thought about it a little bit, and uh, I think maybe... I've taken this for granted. We have a perfect place in Rilo, Gilda's Club, for cancer support. They have workshops, they've got an excellent staff, they have lectures with uh, doctors, prof other professionals, guide you through whatever, disability, healthcare, drug stuff, uh, whatever. They have stuff for kids, they have family night for the kids, they have Noogie Land, if you guys remember Saturday Night Live. McGilda died back in 1989 of ovarian cancer. 
And I just think maybe some people don't know it and don't realize what Gilda's Club is. This is just a beautiful place, just a beautiful place. I had Melanie pass out some stuff. Uh, Jan Miller's a good contact person on there. She'll uh, answer any questions you might have. She set up a presentation if you wanted a presentation of any type. Um, I've had con cancer twice, and I've been a member of Gilda's for 10 years. I don't need the support anymore, but I go to help other people. And uh, when you're first diagnosed, you're a little, you know, a little fearful in that. Your friends and family are great, but until you find someone that understands exactly what you're talking about, and that's what Gilda's is. You go in, you talk about your fears, different things. Everybody's nodding their head. They know, they know what, they've been there. They get it. So I just want everybody to be aware that that's there because I, like I say, I think I might take it for granted that everybody knows about it and maybe everybody doesn't. So it's on Rochester Road, just north of 13 Mile Road. It's 100% free. Um, all the different things they do, it's just fantastic. Um, they're having a 5K run and walk this weekend. I wish I had uh, said something a lot sooner because it's a fundraiser for them. They have various fundraisers. If uh, anybody looking for a good place to throw a couple bucks, throw it to Gilda's Club. It stays right here at Gilda's Metro Detroit. Um, you can also go on Amazon Smile. Everybody buys stuff from Amazon. And you can designate them as a charity, and they'll, and they'll uh, contribute part of your, your money to them, too. So uh, um, just, just be aware that it's there. If anybody needs it, it's there. It's just a fantastic place. And uh, one of my favorite things to do there, I play Santa Claus there every year. And that Melanie passed around a little picture there, and uh, that's uh, my most fun thing to do. Because the kids are great. But I also want to just see how cute my granddaughters are. So, <laughs> and, uh, I was going to say they, they have some workshops to keep your mind and body in tune. And my mind is in tune, but my body's pretty much out of tune. But that's the way it goes when you get old. So, uh, no big deal. But keep Gilda's in mind. Great place to donate. And... Stop by any time there, and I'll show you through the club. So, thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Scott Marion, uh, Real Estate One, uh, two two six two three six North Woodward Royal Oak uh, is my business. I'm here again uh, with Rock and Resources. Um, I actually brought the president of Rock and Resources this evening. I would like to read our uh, our mission statement, which I didn't have available at the time, but now I do. <laughs> um, our mission statement, our ultimate goal, is to guide those who are currently struggling with addiction and to <clears throat> to a new beginning, long term recovery, as well. This terrible epidemic is on the rise and we are working with the communities and other organizations to bring awareness and hope to this growing epidemic. Um, I'm going to let uh, uh, Darren, the president, uh, give you the details on, on it, um, but it is on the rise as everyone knows and this young lady did the proclamation for, for the suicide prevention. Um, Darren uh, started this. Uh, in March of 2017, and we have now done three large events. Um, we want uh, concert events, and we want to bring it to uh, hopefully uh, the farmers market here in February. Um, we're gonna we're gonna try and try and set up uh, a complete event there um, with uh, sorry with uh, um, all the resources that we can uh, get together. We normally have 20 or 30 different uh, vendors uh, that come in and set up tables 
and you can get all the information from them. Basically, with, it, the vendors that, that we bring in will cover every aspect of when they start what the problem. What? Stay your name. Oh, I'm Darren Burgess. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've never been to one of these before, and Scott caught me with this. But uh, uh, I live in Warren, but I grew up in Clawson, and the epidemic itself has just gone so crazy. I mean, it touched kids that I coached in football that are now dead, uh, friends, kids. So I decided to start a, a concert event to make it different than anybody else was doing. So we put bring bands in. So we have the speakers still, but we have music. So they're learning. We're making the communities aware of what's going on in their communities because most people are oblivious to it. They're like, it can't happen here. I mean, Royal Oak, Birmingham, I've been to conferences. I've spoke at conferences, and they all say the same thing. It's not happening here, but it is. It's happening everywhere. Clawson, you name it, it's happening. So this is what we try to do. You know, we have many different vendors and, and people that we work with, uh, different corporations, different companies, different recovery units that we work with throughout the Macomb and Oakland County area, and we're hoping to grow that. We like to do something in Royal Oak because uh, it's a central focus area of Oakland County, and it's, it's, it's an old city. It's been around a long time, and people will come here to listen to what we have to say. The own, the people in the community itself, people in Clawson, people in Troy will come. So it's a nice hub, a nice little area to do an indoor event because we usually do outdoor. We want to do indoor to kind of broaden the horizons and the awareness so it doesn't just have to be in the summer months. That's basically why we're here. And uh, so uh, just to mention a few of the uh, uh, people that have helped us, uh, such as Fan, uh, uh, which our is, supporters. is one of our largest, uh, Hope Not Handcuffs, um, Brian's Hope, um, Box, um, who's that? MCO. Okay, uh, so that's like they govern all of Macomb County. Yeah, There's Macomb County, uh, that's where most of our, our uh, resources have, have uh, helped us bring it to a, a larger event. And uh, hopefully we're, we're going to get some of the Oakland County resources now uh, together. Um, the best thing we can do is be a team. And we do this differently than any other, um, any other uh, organization. So... Thank you for your time. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I hope oh, you re uh, reach out to uh, Jerry the Davids. The request would be to get on the agenda for the October 8th, I believe, uh, council meeting okay. and, and uh, give, a, give a better presentation, uh, possibly with pictures. And of exactly what we want to do and what right. we want to bring uh, possibly the farmer's market. Yeah. And I think if you, if you work with Judy Davids, She'll be able to help you guys kind of shape everything to make sure you can get it on the agenda on the 8th. So everything we need to see, all the permits and everything that would be involved so you guys know exactly what's in it. She's amazing. She's our community engagement specialist. You could talk to me, and I'd probably just say yes to everything and then get in trouble. So that's kind of how it goes with me. <laughs> I leave it up to the people that know what's going on, like Judy David. So um, I, if you will, if it's okay, um, not that we're, we're not pushing you off, but she is really the, the best person charged with helping you guys um, put this in front of us so we can take a look at it. Excellent. Excellent. Thank right. you, Mayor. Thank you, Scott Garen. Take care. Thank you for your hard work. Uh, yes, sir. Here in the, the front in the jacket. Yes, sir. I'm Ronald Gettler, G-U-E-T-T-L-E-R, 235 Orchard View Drive. Uh, lived there 48 years. As some of you will recall, I have indicated difficulty in understanding uh, why so much uh, area on the streets is dedicated to uh, bicycle traffic. And uh, I have communicated with a few of you in the past, and uh, I'm still having difficulty understanding, especially North Main now, uh, as that is being uh, replotted. Uh, and uh, did I understand it? it procedure question uh, it'd be improper for me to ask you questions yeah we, we, we typically don't respond to the questions unless they're really simple because everyone would get into a debate but with the it'd commission be, it'd, be, but it'd be simple okay I don't want to be offensive and I don't want to be out of order but I would like to ask if any of you commissioners ride your bicycles somewhat regularly to work is that improper 
I, if you count being mayor work, yeah. <laughs> I can't ride my bike to Farmington for my day job, but okay. around town. Okay. Hey, hey, some of you do. I just. I'm the same as the mayor. I ride my bike here. This counts as work, but I don't. I don't ride my bike to Ann Arbor, which is where my okay, job is. Okay, you do. Okay, okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. Okay. Well, that helps. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, maybe that'll help me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gettler. Ms. Fairhat. Julie Farhat, 1930 Larome Drive. Um, thank you again for the proclamation designating September as Suicide Prevention Awareness Month and for everyone that's already stood up and um, spoken tonight about how important this cause is. <clears throat> this week, September 9th through 15th, is also National Suicide Prevention Week. And this year's theme is the power of connection. We can all play a role in expanding human connections by going out of our way to talk to someone who might be suffering, feeling alone, or socially isolated. I urge you to have real conversations about mental health and suicide. Share uplifting stories of hope and healing. One conversation could save a life. Many of you already know my story. I lost my mom to suicide in 2005 after a devastating battle with schizophrenia, and I've dedicated the last 13 years of my life to starting a nonprofit organization, Mind Over Matter, lovingly referred to as Mom, and starting the Mom Race here in Royal Oak the first Saturday in May. But I'm not here to talk to you about the Mom Race. Um, I'd actually like to share some daily calls to action, courtesy of the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, things you can do this week and throughout the year to help make a difference. Today, Monday, September 10th, um, I'd like you to consider crisis line funding. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, or 1-800-273-TALK, is a nationwide network of local, free, and confidential crisis centers that provide 24-7 support for individuals in suicidal or emotional distress. This year, more than 75% of the Lifeline's crisis centers have been flat funded or have had their funding reduced, resulting in local call centers having to shut their doors at a time when they're needed the most. A recent CDC report shows that suicide rates are on the rise. In half of states, suicide rates have increased by more than 30% since 1999. Increased funding for their lifeline is critical to ensure these life-saving centers stay open, are properly staffed, and have the capacity to respond to increasing demand for their services. Take action by contacting your elected officials about increasing crisis line funding. Tell them how important crisis lines are and how access to suicide prevention resources will save lives. Um, tomorrow, September 11th, I'd like you to consider research funding. Suicide prevention receives far less funding than other um, major health concerns in this country. Um, research at the Nas National Institute of Mental Health has been flat funded at less than $40 million for the past several years, despite rising suicide rates. There is no single cause of suicide, and suicide risk increases when several health factors and life stressors converge to create an experience of hopelessness and despair. To know who is, at mo who is at risk and how to prevent suicide, scientists need to understand the role of long-term factors such as childhood experiences as well as more immediate factors like mental health and recent life events. A down payment of $150 million to the National Institute of Mental Health would allow further investigation into the circumstances surrounding suicide and effective prevention intervention methods as a necessary treatment investment for us to make major progress in low lowering the national suicide rate. You can take action by urging your elected officials to increase funding for suicide prevention researching research at the National Institute of Mental Health. I'm just going to um, summarize these last three, and the more information is, um, or excuse me, these last two, and you can find more information um, on the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention webpage. They have a call to action page there this week. Um, um, on Wednesday, September 11th, um, we'd like you to consider taking action by contacting your elected officials to urge for their continued support for service member and veteran suicide prevention programs and services and access to mental health care. And lastly, on Thursday, September 13th, um, I'd like you to consider mental health parity um, by contacting your elected officials today to remind them that equal access to mental health and substance abuse services save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Farhat. Thank you for all your hard work you do. So, Mr. McGee. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. 
not take up too much time. Uh, my name's uh, Pat McGee, 4524 Elmhurst. Um, let me just start by uh, appreciate the individuals that took the time to respond to my email today to you. Um, if you did not receive it, um, I'm sure one of your colleagues can send it. Um, I've come to uh, talk to you about my concerns about the current state of the Normandy Oaks Golf Course uh, slash uh, park. Um, I've been documenting and, and cataloging what's been going on there, and, and I've just have some concerns. And um, this last weekend, I finally heard a big crash that uh, prompted me to go and see what it was. And one of our giant oak trees on the site currently fell over and is half into the mosquito pond and half into the uh, nature area that uh, the park wanted to save, which the, the tree took out multiple other trees. And I don't know if you guys have had a chance to in inspect it, but quite a few trees were lost. So I'm requesting um, that uh, if you guys could instruct the Normandy Oaks Task Force to have a update status, uh, current state of the, the park, what's, gone, what's been done, what stills have been done. Um, Mike sent out a nice uh, social media post that kind of informed everybody that was what was going on. Very appreciative. Um, the, not just because of the tree fell down, but I've noticed some concerns. Like there's two big hills of dirt that was from the Robinson Brothers development that has been used to create what was the basis of the sledding hills. But that dirt is filled with landscaping debris, irrigation pipe, broken glass, broken tools, which if you're gonna be sledding down a hill with broken glass on it, not a good idea. Um, as well as there's a lot of trash being blown from the Robertson Brothers development into the park, being caught in the fences, coming into the neighborhood, um, which not the best situation as you're picking up house wrap and drywall and Romex wire and all sorts of other various tubes and containers of construction debris. So that's it. Um, in summary, just a request to the Normandy Oaks Task Force to have a, hey, what's going on? What's still to be done? And what's the current state of the, the park? If you guys could request that to the Normandy Oaks Task Force. That's it. Thank you. Alan Ashley, Royal Oak Manor. Um, everybody knows the movie Cool Hand Luke and the famous line, what we have here is a failure to communicate. Um, Monday or Tuesday before Art Beats and Eats, I went to the police station, talked to Sergeant Tykow, and was asking for information about where will Royal Oak Manor residents be parking since the parking lot across from us is going to be used by Art Beats and Eats. I was told definitely that we could park on Williams, 6th, and 7th, and the vendors are parking some, someplace else. Uh, just to make sure I wasn't hearing wrong, I asked the sergeant twice. And he says, definitely, they're parking someplace else. So uh, he told me to go down to the treasures, pick up these official arts beats and eats passes, make sure our residents follow the direction on the side, on the back, put their name and address on it, put it on the front dash, and they won't be ticketed or towed away on William 6th or 7th. Friday afternoon at 1.30, Lieutenant Moon and his partner came by and says, you have to move all these cars out of here. They're all for vendors. The, Normally, when we have Arts, Beats, and Eats and we move, we put the people who work late, 3.30 in the morning, cut back, or people who can't walk very far, we put them on close inside our parking lot so they don't have that far to go. Well, because we could park on the street and put there, I didn't have any worries. Well, come that Friday at 1.30, they said we now have to park at Lafayette, which is on the other side of Washington, and on Knowles, which is like two and a half blocks away, almost a quarter mile for some of us seniors to walk. Problem is, all I want to know is how the information was changed from, yes, we could park there and the vendors are parking someplace else. When did they know it? And if they knew it before Friday, why didn't they tell us? Because if I had known before Friday, I could have made and switched around parking places and put the people that needed it in the parking lot so they didn't have to park. But now we had people that had, were parking over in Lafayette and Knowles. Lieutenant Moon and his partner were terrific. The police were terrific. The even Lieutenant Moon said, you call the police department and we'll, because of this mix-up. And he says, and he told me to my face and a couple other members there of the Royal Oak Manor that, you were told the wrong information. All I want to know is, by somebody, when did you know, 
and why didn't you tell us? Uh, the police did do shuttling, several of our members back and forth. We shuttled, we shuttled some others, but that is the problem. Why weren't we told before 1.30 in the afternoon on Friday and I had to move 18 cars by 5 o'clock out of that space? Thank you. Hello, I am uh, Janice Hunter. Uh, jo yeah. Joy Hunter, she lives at 606 uh, William Street. Um, our issue again is with the parking passes. I purchased a parking pass for August after our last meeting concerning me being a caregiver for my mother and not having a place to park at Royal Oak Manor. So I purchased the pass. The back of the pass says that it's not valid August 28th through September the 4th. I said, okay. They gave me this pass, I said, okay, and as he stated, if we were to park on the street, you know, and I came back and forth to take care of my mother, and then we get there, and it's like, no, you can't park there. You have to park down at the lot. So I go down to the lot. The problem is, at the parking lot, they had no clue what I was talking about. So it was a matter of me sitting there and waiting while this person asked this person who asked another person who asked another person, and finally being able to park. But I had to go through this every day that I come, not to mention... What they, what they failed to do when, when they told us we can no longer park on the streets is that in order to get from the parking lot to the building, you have to walk through the, the Arts, Beats, and Eats. You can't get in if you don't pay. And I wasn't paying to walk two blocks, which means I had to walk down to 11 Mile, back up and all around to get back directly across the street from where I was going. And one, of the, one day the lady let me pass, and she's like, well, you have to have a wristband. They should have given you a wristband. Well, they didn't give us a wristband because they gave us these and told us we could park on the street, which is not true. And they all, almost didn't want me to park in the structure because it says you have to be within 200 feet of your building. But again, at the structure, they had no clue what this was or why I had it. The other issue is that it says it's not valid the 28th through September the 4th, okay? This, to September the 4th, this ends on September the 3rd. They're still in the lot on September the 4th breaking down, which means now I have a pass that I paid for that I can't use because these two say two completely different things. One ends on the 4th, the other ends on the 3rd, which leaves me a day without a place to park in the place that I paid for. Thank you. Hey, Ms. Hunters. Mr. Wagman. Wegman's going, sorry. Alexandra Wellesley. <clears throat> this November, residents will be faced with a ballot proposal to change the city charter for an around town bus service. Despite the task force and this commission stating their job was done and it is now up to the voters to decide, a political movement has begun to promote its passage, including seeking funds from non residents. Royal Oak residents who have attempted to post additional facts on Facebook have been blocked and their comments deleted. So I'm using this opportunity to bring those facts to the public and to those commissioners who will be out helping promote this charter in the near future. Charter amendment. The costs. The costs are more than $15 million, Royal Oak, ta Royal Oak taxpayer dollars, more than doubling what we now pay for bus service. Owners of a $200,000 home will see their taxes for bus service increase from $100 per year to $225. Included in annual costs are $115,000 for a manager, $80,000 for education, among other things. Other cities have partnered with private services at substantially less costs. Parents, the cost for your child to ride the bus to school is going to be up to $360 a year on top of the taxes you're going to be assessed. Safety issues. Why do we have school buses? School buses are yellow, have large stop signs and flashing lights for visibility and your child's safety along, for your child's safety along with other safety feature, features. School bus drivers are required to pass special training not given to smart drivers, report to school district 
uh, items such as bully bullying, and they don't report to SMART. They're trained to handle special issues such as bullying. Buses go to specific schools, so middle schoolers and high schoolers are not on the same bus. We have a 2,400 student enrollment in Royal Oak Middle and High School, but this bus uh, service has small um, connector buses, not large enough to handle what the school district needs. So our Royal Oak Transit is not a school bus. Seniors. Seniors, this more than doubles your taxes for all bus services also. You will receive less than 10% of the revenue from the millage for, school tra for senior transportation. Buses and drivers are not supplied by SMART. We've been waiting two years for a, for a bus replacement. I appreciate the amount of work that was put into developing this pro proposal. However, like Normandy Oaks, everything is subject to change after you vote for it, including the actual routes, frequency, and placement of bus stops, which could be in front of some people's homes. I urge voters to consider these additional facts and ask themselves if there aren't better places to spend over $15 million, like maintaining what we currently have. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. My name is Chad Herbert. I live at 1031 Oak Ridge. Um, I wish I could say I was happy to be here tonight. Uh, I'd rather be at home with my family, but I felt compelled to come here and express my disappointment. Uh, my disappointment is with generally any contact with any of the offices downstairs. Um, I feel that, and you know and probably took some kind of oath, you have a fiduciary responsibility and a responsibility to do what's best for the citizenship as a whole and not um, pursue your own personal agendas. I'm not saying that you have any. But collectively, it feels like the city does what they want to, whether it's what we want or not. I'll give you some specific examples. Uh, there's no reciprocity with anything that involves money. For example, you get a parking ticket, there's a notice that says if it's not paid within 10 days, we're going to charge you more. When's the last time you guys ever cut a check within 10 days? Um, specific example, um, so I'm a resident, I'm also a contractor, I'm also an attorney. I did a job for my neighbor, I didn't want to, but he couldn't find the appropriate help to do it helped them come down here and pull the appropriate permit, wrote a $2,000 check. We did the job. Uh, Matt, the, the inspector, approved it, I believe, on the 3rd of August. Whatever a bond report is, I don't know, but it got run on the 23rd or something like that. And knowing that the city cuts checks on the 15th and the 30th, I did everything I could do to get that thing approved so that they would get their money back in a prompt manner should have been cut the 15th of August. Come to find out, oh, this report thing didn't get run until the 26th. Um, the 30th went by. You know, we made a couple of phone calls. I was explaining there was like four or five different approvals for this to happen. This does not incent people to do things the right way. It costs a lot of money. It's turmoil. I have to do stuff like come here tonight you need to work with us, not against us. We try and improve our homes. We pay through the nose to do work on our own properties. That is completely asinine. Let us work on our stuff. Let us pay a small amount of money to do it, or we're just going to do it anyway. And that's how a lot of, of, uh, of us feel as homeowners, as contractors. That's it. You know, we get told, well, the city may not want to let you do this. It's not our privilege to live here. We work hard to live here. We don't work for you. You work for us. It's you folks that are supposed to do stuff for our benefit. If anybody is to be burdened, it should be the folks getting paid, not the folks that are trying to live here and be prosperous and raise a family and do stuff right. Instead, you come here, you deal with departments, and you feel like hurting somebody when you walk out of here. That should never happen. 
So I want to thank you for the time tonight, but at the same time, I'm, I'm pretty much disappointed with what's going on. You need to revisit your paperwork processes. You need to get stuff handled, tighten up the act a little bit, get, get stuff done right the first time, every time, shorten the processes. There's no reason six people have to look at something. You know, there's offices full of people looking busy, typing away. You're standing at a counter. Nobody's there to help you. But what are they doing? So these are some of the general concerns that a lot of, of us have with dealing with the city as a whole. Forgive me if I bored you, but just letting you know how a lot of us, of us feel. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Herbert. Thanks for coming out tonight. Anybody else here wish to speak at public comment? Going once, going twice. All right, we're going to bring the meeting back up to this side of the table. Which brings us to item number seven of the agenda, which is approval of the agenda. <coughs> uh, Commissioner Douglas. Approval of the agenda. A motion by Commissioner Douglas, a second by Commissioner Macy. Is there discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes. We have an agenda. Which brings us to number item number eight on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. Anybody wish to pull anything off the consent agenda? Commissioner Lavasser? Uh, there are several uh, vacancies or positions to be filled. I'd like to have each of those pulled. Uh, so we're looking at A, uh, E, G, H, I, and J. Okay. Let me just mark them on here because I won't be able to remember to read them all. A, E, G. You almost hit all the vowels, Commissioner Lavasser. You sure that wasn't your intent? All right. Um, anybody else? Okay, that leaves us a consent agenda, which consists of claims for August 31st and September 11th, 2018, approval of purchase orders, declaration, disposal of surplus equipment, Approval of high intensity drug trafficking area subrecipient agreement. Uh, approval for cross connection inspection agreement. Approval of geographical information system consulting and support contract. Award of professional engineering services, traffic signal design. Award of professional engineering services, CAP 1910 design. Contract modification, CAP 1710, water main improvements. And receive and file non action items, which includes the August 2018 investment report. I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as read. Commissioner Douglas? So moved. A motion by Commissioner Douglas, a second by Commissioner Dubuck. Discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, the motion passes. All right, that brings us to items number, or letters A E G H I J, formerly of the consent agenda. Commissioner Lavasser. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a few concerns here. First, uh, and I, I understand Mr. Johnson sent uh, an email out um, uh, uh, sometime this afternoon. I have not had a chance to review that yet, but, but I have several questions with regard to these positions. Uh, first is distinguishing those that are, are, are there to replace someone who, who is retiring or leaving or something of that nature and uh, making a distinction between those and uh, those which would be uh, the filling of, of brand new or, or the creation of brand new positions. Uh, second is getting a sense of what type of dollars are we talking about? What is the, the anticipated base salary, the anticipated benefits uh, that, that we're, we're being asked to, to, uh, to approve here tonight? <clears throat> is that question directed at Mr. Johnson? I, I believe so. Mr. Johnson, I'll let you take the lead on it. Okay. I can't answer every bit of your question uh, from from memory, but uh, every one of these positions is budgeted. Uh, I can tell you the city clerk's uh, position is a vacancy uh, due to a retirement that's going to occur in about two weeks. Is that correct? She's put in her notice she's leaving in December, but December. we'd like to get someone in sooner, especially with the election. Uh, the finance department position is one where the finance director is anticipating a possible vacancy and wants authority to fill it as soon as that occurs. Uh, 
the human resources one is one that was actually uh, approved in the budget process or following the budget process a year ago but didn't get it filled uh, building department one is in the budget uh, and it's being paid for through state construction code funds uh, and the two IT positions are ones that we discussed at length uh, in the budget process uh, those are new positions uh, I don't have the cost data here uh, tonight because we did that in the budget process with regard to the uh, building uh, division request, and you mentioned that'd be paid for through state funds, uh, would those funds be available to us? State construction code funds. Sorry, construction that, that code. That does not funds. mean they're state money. It's it's money that comes from building permits. Okay. All right. All right. So so actually, everything related to the building department is paid for from permit fees. There's no general fund money that goes to the building. Okay. Department. So it's 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 not state funded at all. It's just it's what people pay, yeah. uh, a user fee of, of sorts. But the fund is called the state construction code fund because they exist to enforce the state construction code. Okay. Uh, I I would feel much more comfortable discussing these with some hard numbers saying this is what we're anticipating these positions to cost us and uh, I, the, the information that was provided us tonight I, I simply don't believe it's sufficient for us to, to move forward on these well the, the it's only unusual that there were so many done at once but the, the format of the letter is the standard format we've been using for some time we can provide the additional information I just can't do it tonight but we could if you want to delay these, we could do it in two weeks. Commissioner Dubuck. Sorry, just to clarify, Mr. Johnson, are these, these are already previously approved and anticipated costs included in our previous budget? Yes. So we did uh, receive a breakdown of these numbers in the budget? Yes. Okay. I'll move for approval of the positions as identified, given that we've already previously discussed these expenses and approved them. Commissioner Dubuck makes a motion, and it's uh, seconded by Commissioner Pruch. Yes. Further discussion? Commissioner Levasseur. I don't believe this is the appropriate way to proceed. I mean, this commission has a, a duty to the public here. Uh, and we can't simply move forward on these without sufficient information. There, there's other concerns as well. It's about setting priorities. Uh, I would have no problem approving the replacement of people who are about to leave. But when we're talking about adding new positions, we really should uh, look at that a little bit more closely. Uh, and ask the question, is this the priorities that are important to the, our community? Uh, I note that there's nothing here that uh, uh, does anything more to improve our parks. There's nothing more that does anything here to um, increase the speed in which we clean up snow after a big snowfall. Uh, and I believe that those are more the priorities of, of, of the members of our community than uh, what we have going here. Uh, we've added a lot of overhead in the last several years. Uh, it's been pointed out uh, in public comments that since we enacted our public safety millage in 2012, adding about $9.5 million per year, uh, that we've only added roughly $2 million per year in new police officers, but we've added roughly $4 million a year in new administrators. Uh, and rather than grow the size of our government, I think we should be taking a look at whether or not uh, we're giving the, the people what it is that they're expecting, what it is that they want, uh, and looking for ways to be more efficient, not simply growing the size of government. Commissioner Douglas. I would assert that what people want from city government is service. And the positions that we are looking to fill are, in many cases, direct facing positions that the public comes to. We had a gentleman in here tonight um, complaining about the level of service he received in, in certain transactions with the city. Um, the way we meet those we needs, the way we serve our people, is by the staff. I mean, that's what we do. We're a service business. We filled, I think, four parks and rec positions a couple years ago. So, I mean, different departments have needs that come up at different times, and we did fill some parks openings, um, at least within my tenure um, on the commission. Um, furthermore, over the, uh, over the, we had severe staff cuts early on in our history. As we responded to a shrinking economy, we're now in a position where our tax revenue is coming back up again, and we have the capacity to fill these positions, which are budgeted. I mean, we have a fiduciary responsibility to follow our budget, 
This money is all in the budget. There's no reason not to approve it. Is your hand up? Commissioner Macy. So I completely agree with Commissioner Lavasser that this is not the time to be having this discussion, which is why I'm glad we had the discussion during the strategic planning sessions and the budget sessions that we had earlier this year. Um, I agree that I probably was also not as fully informed as I wanted to be during those planning sessions, and I hope that this next year I'll be able to more adequately uh, push for things like more parks funding. Uh, however, we did have this discussion. We talked to the heads of these departments um, in depth, and we spent quite a bit of time on this. We've approved this already. This is just <laughs> giving them permission to do what we already told them they could do. Mr. Proust? You know, when you talk about the services that the city residents look out for, you mentioned parks and snow plowing and all of the kinds of things that you, we see when the services are actually being performed. But when I'm looking specifically at the, at the information technology request to fill vacancies, especially for the security analyst and the network engineer, we have to remember that we are a public agency and this, this building and the other buildings that are connected to it in terms of the services that we provide hold an awful lot of public information, information about all of us as residents. And you all know, because you've all been watching everything else on television and reading about it, the significant, significant cybersecurity threats that are out there that have impacted your banks and your financial institutions and your target stores and everything else and your credit card companies. And one of these positions is to actually put in place a security analyst position in our government so that we can build up our protections against cyber threats to public information that is here within that we hold. We have, we have a duty, we have a strong duty to protect that information as much as we can. And what our information technology people are telling us is that we do not have the staff and we do not have the software in order to protect it as best we can and as best as we should be. And so this is one of those positions that needs to be filled. This is not snow plowing, it's not, it's not park maintenance, it's not new parks, but it is critical, critical services and protection that we have to provide, that we are duty bound to provide to our residents because they have information that we hold, that we have pledged to them that we will protect. And what our people are telling us is we need these positions in order to better protect public information. And so I will definitely vote for this. Uh, we've needed it for a while. I'm glad that the department is stepping forward and putting the, the positions in place in order to handle this. And I can't believe anybody would vote against this type of protection because it's essential. Commissioner Dubuck, did I see your hand? I think that was well said. I'm fine, thanks. Okay. Any other discussion? All right. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. All right, motion passes. We'll have our critical resources in place hopefully soon. All right, this brings us to item number nine, high water bills report. <coughs> I think this is going to Mr. Johnson, if I remember the... This is going to go to Ms. Hubanks. Ms. Hubanks. Oh, hi, Ms. Hubanks. Hi. Um, the information that you have in front of you was... Um, based on the request that was made a couple weeks ago or a couple meetings ago about identifying um, high use properties and um, coming up with uh, um, an analysis of what happens to create these situations. Um, we issue about 100,000 bills a year. Um, out of those, we determined or made a determination what would be considered high use um, bills in order for us to do our first pass of analysis. Well, AWWA, who is the American um, Water Works Association, says that for a family of four, a typical water use would be 30 units. Um, would that be fair to say every household uses 30 units in a quarter? No, but it is an attempt to make a, a baseline. So from there, we decided to go um, and look at properties that used over 25% of that 30 units per quarter, um, which would be 120 units a year, the 25% over 150 units. So we went through our... Um, 
our usage reports and identified properties that used over 150 units in a year. Um, of those, we came up with residential properties, 39 of them that used over that amount, and um, that is one of your attachments. And um, looking at those properties, um, we saw some trends. Um, one of them was new properties. A lot of times with construction, you'll have a lawn being put in, so you have a spike in use for one quarter that the construction happens or that they install a sprinkler system or that they try to stabilize new grass. So you see a number of those you'll see a number of properties where there was an identified leak, either identified on our side um, through our reading system or identified by the customer that there was a leak. Um, you know, 99% of the problems, it, it's a toilet. Um, that is a very typical water issue. And um, there are a number of things that when we identify that, we help the customer um, resolve those or make suggestions on how to resolve those. Um, there's some that we identified um, pipe leaks, other type of leaks, um, those are listed. Out of the 39, there were six properties that we could not pinpoint, nor could the customer pinpoint. Um, a lot of times that will be, there has been a problem. Uh, a, a toilet has leaked in the basement um, or, or an area where the customer doesn't usually use the house. Upstairs, basements, typical problems. Main floor, people either hear the leak or, or use the facilities more, so they, in effect, fix their own leak by using... Um, you know, uh, flushing the toilet, it resets the flapper, so the problem is taken care of. Um, but in every one of these cases, you know, for the most part, we have identified what the issue are, except for those six. The one was um, the property that had a question a couple of meetings ago, what could happen? If you look on um, the information I provided, You'll see that a unbelievably small leak can create quite a few gallons of usage. I believe that customer stated that his usage was almost 200,000 units or 200,000 gallons. Well, that would be less than a one eighth leak. That is not necessarily a leak that is discernible, um, you know, that you would hear. A lot of times toilet leaks you don't hear. It goes through the center tube, it leaks into the bowl. Um, when the weight is so high in the bowl, it will flush itself. You may hear that, you may not hear that. So a lot of times it's not identifiable to the customer. Um, one of the things that you know I have used before and I would suggest here, the single best thing to do is to educate the customer. Um, what I've prepared here is an attachment that we currently have made available at the treasurer's office that I would suggest that we do a mailing to all of our customers because, like I say, 90, 95, 99% of the problems are toilet leaks or things that the customer can identify. Giving them these tools help them to prevent high water bills in the future. If the single thing that anyone would do is read your own meter once a month, write it down on a calendar, notate what your typical use is so that you could identify when you were using higher than what your quarterly bills are. If you have four people in your house, that AWWA is a great standard, 30 units. If you water your lawn, you may be at 40 units, 50 units, but you'll have it that baseline if you take regular reads of your meter and monitor your own use. There's a couple other things, you know, that are good things to watch, but the big thing, you know, my single most useful suggestion to any customer is making your own water reads and an important task to do at least monthly. 
No questions from Ms. Eubanks? Commissioner Dubuck. Um, thanks for this. I think this is really insightful given the conversation that we were having about, you know, what's the frequency of these kinds of serious issues. So if I'm understanding this right, in a given year or in the year that you've studied, out of 100,000 bills gone out, there's six of these incidents where someone's had a spike in usage and we cannot explain why and they can't explain why. Correct. Okay. So six out of 100,000. So yes. Six hundred thousandth of a time. So I'd say that's, by no definition, is that a chronic problem or anything broken within our system? No. That being said, to those families that that happens to, those households, it's a, it's a big deal. Um, but there's not a systemic problem that we need to fix here, in your, according to this, that I'm, that I'm understanding. Correct. Okay. So I'll make sure I'm reading this right. And, and just as a point of clarification, when we say we can't resolve it, it is possible that there was a leak for a period of time, and then the leak went away, and then when we go out or the homeowner investigates, that leak no longer exists, and that is a possibility within, the, within those six, correct? Absolutely. Okay, it just means that when we go out there to inspect, there's no smoking gun or red flag that says this is it, and the homeowner was unaware, oh, yeah, I heard that sound, you know, for two months, and now it's gone. It's just these are six where at the time we went to investigate, there was no evidence, uh, you know, smoking gun evidence that we could accurately say it was this toilet or this faucet or something like that. Right. It doesn't mean that, it, that a faucet or toilet wasn't leaking. It just means when we get there, we couldn't identify it. Correct. Okay. And we're taking the homeowners at their word, too, which Correct. more than likely they're honest and, you know, we just don't know. Commissioner Lavasser. Uh, but by my count, there was uh, 10 discrepancies between the outside reading device and the inside meter. Uh, and I counted four new construction situations with, with the rest falling into the category of either there's leaks uh, that were identified or, or unidentified or were simply shrugging our shoulders, we're not quite sure. What One thing that I couldn't quite do is put dollars to drips here uh, in, in getting a sense of how significant these numbers are. I kind of glanced and I, I see there's one on Donald, which I presume the first one is the power situation from a, a month or so ago. And I'm seeing the big spike of 258 that bill, I believe, was a little over three thousand dollars, if I recall correctly. Yes. Is is that what I should expect if I see about a two hundred and forty unit usage? That's about three thousand dollars. Yes. Would it be difficult to give us another spreadsheet? But taking only those that I've identified, those with leaks or those with question marks, and actually putting a dollar figure next to the uh, uh, the quarterly payment where there was a spike, mm. so that we could put that we could visualize that and kind of get a better sense of what our next steps should be? Not a problem at all. Thank you. Mr. Gibbs. Because I don't know, um, does do the city water employees, if called, or can an appointment be made to have them come out and look at your house? Um, we don't so much look at your house we look at the meter so if we go out there and um you know everything is turned off and actually we suggest this at the time that they call turn everything off look at your meter um go back in a couple hours look at your meter again if there's any use and you know you haven't run water you have a problem the meter person can go out there and do the same thing because sometimes we'll have people they're not quite sure where their inside meter is and we do schedule a service call for that. Okay, so a service call is available to any resident? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Commissioner Douglas. Well, just a quick comment. I was pleased to read the level of response that the city gives. That is, we are we do have staff who are on the alert for unusually high meter readings. We do make a couple of attempts if we can't reach the homeowner to come back to leave a, a door hanger. The staff does follow up with that. So it's not like we're ignoring problems. In fact, it seems like we're being proactive um, to find those cases and educate those homeowners. Uh, that said, I like the idea of an educational piece to, I mean, easily to go out in the water bill, that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I was happened to be at the 
treasurer's counter today, and I saw uh, copies of the report there at the treasurer's counter. So I'm glad staff has already kind of taken at least um, an incremental step to educating the people that they do touch from day to day. I'll just add to that one of the other things that I mean, looking at this, not just the proactive part, but which was encouraging to me, was the reactive part when there is an issue. You know, we're working with the homeowners, not just saying, hey, pay the bill, but hey, let's help you find where the leak is. Let's understand if it's a sprinkler head, if it's a toilet leak, and really walking through. And it, again, out of 39, um, you know, there's six that pretty much remained unresolved, which could have self solved themselves weeks before coming out, which, um, you know, I think is a, um, I don't know that you always get that sort of uh, service with every um, product you buy. Um, at least on the government end. Uh, so I was encouraged that our folks are out there trying to help. And that's the sense I'm getting, um, that they're on the front line trying to mitigate water bills for people if they do have an issue. We try. Commissioner Perush. The only thing that I will note quickly is that if I'm looking at this correctly, out of the six, two you tagged and tried to identify and contact multiple times and got no response correct so really you're actually talking about four that really really couldn't be resolved out of a hundred thousand right because two people were just ignoring you and were paying any attention or didn't care and maybe they had a hydroponics lab yes <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure they didn't commissioner macy uh, first of all, I'm going to debate, debate the math a little bit because 100,000 is all the bills, and we're talking about sometimes there's more more than one quarter in the house. So we're, it's like six for the 25,000 houses, homes. Yes? Right, but I've um, outlaid here all four quarters. So this would be six quarters, or, or I'm sorry, um, 39 quarters that were unusually high. If you look on there, nobody has, I don't think, well, the one property that it was an unidentified leak had multiple quarters. Oh, okay. But, I saw a few that had multiple quarters. Um, sometimes those leaks hump over a billing period or a reading period. In any case, it's six in a year, right? Right. Yeah, okay. I also love the idea of sending out the report. I think that's a great idea. Uh, I wonder if we could also, just regularly with the water bill, once we've sent the report out, also include just a little line that says, you know, last year, 40 people had unexpected high water bills. What, here's one thing you can do this month. So like every time, just one of the suggestions, because you have a whole bunch of suggestions that are great. Um, I also wondered if we could maybe send out a little calendar that's just you know, one of those things that have the blanks, um, you know, January through December, where they can say, put this up by your water meter and check it every month. And I was also thinking, Judy, maybe we could add it to our app so that people could, like a little reminder, check your water this month. Hey, why does it just have to be water? We can say change your filter, you know? We can <laughs> oh, build yeah. a department we can get on that, fires. fire department on the, uh, I mean, there's probably a whole lot of things that we could do just as a good PSAs for people. I mean, we're talking about water bills, but, you know, why take them one at a time? Why not just offer some people a service to remind them how to maintain their home, you know? Check your filters. You know, air quality is important. Public health and safety. Okay. New homeowners especially don't know to change their filters. Um, we change ours every three months. My father comes over and prefers that we change them every two, but we have that debate. Um, and, you know, with uh, fire uh, alarms and smoke detectors and things like that, you know, it's, um, you know, probably I like the idea of, of pushing forward those PSAs. If anything, people know to do it. They just need to be reminded. Yeah. Any other questions, thoughts? Okay. Most you banks, we appreciate the hard work digging into it. Thank Very you. Very insightful. Always love good data. Yeah. Who has a hand up? Are we are we going to revisit this? Commissioner Lavasser asked for a numbers to be added to this. Um, well, I think that will. I mean, we can update the report and we can get it sent out to the commission. I mean, do we have to make it an agenda item to talk about the dollars? You can do it however you would like. I'd prefer that it be part of an agenda item so that uh, uh, it's something that is going to be available to the public as well as to us. Since it's just a report, do you mind if we put it under the uh, non-action items? Uh, I've, I've got no problem with that. Okay. We, we can always, if, if we believe action needs to be taken, we can always make That's a right. move at that point. Okay. Everybody good? All right. Brings us to item number 10, approval of fiscal year 2018-19 budget amendments. Ms. Rudd. Good evening, Mayor, City Commissioners. Um, 
I have before you here um, requested amendments for numerous funds. Um, would you like me to step through them? Yeah, we could give a, a quick um, overview of the major ones at least, and then if anyone has any questions, we can okay. you know, talk about the smaller ones. Okay. Uh, the general fund, um, there's two uh, requests there. Um, on the expenditure side, uh, realtor park equipment and installation uh, for not quite $40,000, and there is a matching donation from the Greater Metropolitan Association of Realtors to, to fund that. And then there is a transfer uh, to the grants fund for the matching portion of a bicycle safety grant, and um, that's for $3,880, and use of fund balance would be used. Um, to support that. Um, the Public Safety Fund request um, to transfer in from the Police Grants Fund 41000 that was over-transferred in a prior year. Um, we thought we were going to expend 100% of the officer out of the Police Grants Fund, and we ended up splitting it 50-50. So we're just paying back the Public Safety Fund from the grant fund that was over-transferred in a prior year. Um, CDBG Fund, uh, there's $300,000 for outdoor uh, fitness equipment um, in a park. There's uh, housing rehab deferred loans at approximately $196,000 and contingency approximately $122,000. And all of this, of course, is funded by the Federal Grant Entitlement Program. Uh, the next one, the Police Grants Fund, that is just the other side of that transaction I was talking about uh, under the Public Safety Fund. Um, miscellaneous Grants Fund, we are requesting uh, an amendment for approximately 44000 for the Royal Oak, uh, the total for the Royal Oak Bicycle Safety Education Campaign. And much of that is uh, 32000 is um, coming in from a FEMA grant. And uh, then there is, excuse me, a bicycle safety grant. And then there is 32,000 requested for a FEMA emergency planning project. And um, that funding is coming from the FEMA planning grant. Um, other than that, there are three other funds that we are not officially requesting an amendment for as they are enterprise and um, internal service funds. Um, so you will not see them in the resolution, but we um, keep you updated on those through this letter. Um, throughout the year, Arts, Beats, and Eats, we're requesting to uh, amend that um, as an increase of $25,000. That is to pay the sponsorship payment that is in the Arts, Beats, and Eats contract that was new this year. And uh, that money will come out of uh, retained earnings. And then Water and Sewer Fund, we have... Um, a consultant for the implementation of the stormwater utility at 226000 and then for 70000 requesting residential cross-connection inspections. That is something uh, new this year. We were not doing the residential uh, cross-connections in prior years. Um, and then finally, um, for the Ice Arena Fund, the condenser towers came in, uh, the bids came in 30000 higher than um, anticipated or budgeted. So we're requesting uh, an additional $30,000 and that will come from retained earnings out of the Ice Arena Fund. Questions from Ms. Rudd? Commissioner Perush. I'll move approval of the resolution amending the various budgets that need to be amended by the resolution. A motion by Commissioner Perush. Is there a second? Second by, okay, second by Commissioner Dubuck. Uh, discussion. All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Rudd. Um, this brings us to item number 11, Construction Code Board of Appeals Ordinance Amendment, second reading. Mayor Fournier and City Commissioners, this is a second reading of a proposed amendment to the Construction Code Board of Appeals Ordinance. As we discussed at our last meeting, this would reduce the number of members of the Construction Code Board of Appeals from five to three, and also formalize the two-year term for appointments to the board. Uh, the ordinance currently does not provide for a term, but by default under the State Construction Code, 
uh, the term is two years, so that would formalize the two-year term. So if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but we're recommending approval of the ordinance on second reading. Questions for Mr. Gillum? Commissioner Douglas. No, I'll move approval of the resolution. Motion by Commissioner Douglas, second by Commissioner Perush. Discussion? No. Commissioner Macy? I'm going to renew my objection to reducing the membership of the board from five to three. The only reasoning that I heard about it last time was that it's hard to fill this position, but um, maybe that's true and everyone here knows it but me, but I don't know it. I've never had a chance, and it seems like if it hasn't been active since 2003, we haven't really tried very hard to be filling the vacant positions. Um, so I'd like a chance to try to fill them. Um, I don't like to reduce the opportunity to participate in our community, our democracy here, without a, a better reason than we don't think there's anyone out there. There's certainly a lot of construction happening right now. A lot of people seem very invested in the construction that's happening, and I think we might have qualified people who would be able to fill these positions. That's all. Any other discussion? Just say it's a fair point Commissioner Macy brings up. I think I'll be supporting the resolution only because this isn't the last line of um, petition that uh, folks can go to. There is the uh, State Construction Appeal Board and everything like that, and I feel like there's necessary redundancies there built in place that will, you know, compensate for the lack of the two people, but um, no, your point's well taken. Um, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Motion passes. That brings us to item number 12, securing residential construction and demolition sites ordinance amendment first reading. Mayor and Commissioners, this is first reading of amendments to the residential construction site ordinance. Uh, these amendments are based upon input that Mr. Craig from the building department had previously provided to the commission and direction that the commission had uh, provided to my office indicating that they wanted to see those recommendations in the form of a proposed ordinance. So what you have in front of you is consistent with the recommendations that Mr. Craig made. Um, if this is something the commission chooses to move forward on tonight, there is one typographical error that the eagle eyes down in the building department caught. Um, which would be in uh, subsection A. Um, the second to last sentence reads, temporary fencing may be removed after a complete installation inspection has been approved. And it should read, temporary fencing may be removed after a complete installation inspection has been removed. So um, with that one change, uh, my office is recommending approval of the ordinance on first reading tonight. Okay. Assume you mean approved, not removed. Approved, yes. What it says, not what I say. <laughs> this is an inspection to make sure that there is a competitive bid for the uh, insulation, right? No. no. <laughs> Commissioner Dubuck. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. I think uh, this is pretty well reflective of the conversation we had. I think it's going to address some of the issues that have been raised, and we continue to inch along on perfecting this ordinance. So our residents uh, and we in the neighborhoods are, you know, minimally inconvenienced by this the surge of construction that continues uh, around us. Uh, one thing I'm, I just want to make sure I'm clear on. So renovations and additions of less than 50% of the square footage of the building, um, or uh, of the original building or structure. So what is is there a definition to renovation? So if, if I'm gutting my, my bathroom, say I got a 1,200 square foot bungalow or ranch, and I'm doing my bathroom, my living room, just gutting them and, and, and you know, remodeling them, um, but not doing any external construction. Um, would that square footage math apply? Like if I'm only doing things internally, am I still building a fence? If I'm remodeling two out of my four rooms in my house? I mean, and is that necessary? I'm, it strikes me as I probably shouldn't have to fence in the house if I'm just kind of gutting and renovating internally without any exterior work. Or am I off on that? No, you're right on. No, that, that's a good question. Um, what are we doing today? Well, 
Well, I think today, because there is no exemption, I think the fencing would be required. I, I mean, that's my best guess anyway. I don't know specifically. I'm not sure how Mr. Craig has interpreted it up to this point in time. So that's, I feel like that's something that needs a, we need a definition of the renovations where that, that might be exempt if they're internal. I don't know if there's construction words that would make that make sense, but it seems like there's a common sense yeah, threshold at which, you know, if I'm doing my 11, 600 and my 1100 square feet uh, between a bathroom and a kitchen, uh, and uh, is that, should that be fenced off? And it feels like probably not. So. We can address that uh, prior to second reading. Okay. Okay. Oh, so maybe bring something, uh, use your legal genius and <laughs> address that in some magical way that I can't think of. <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get input from Mr. Craig too, so. Okay. Mr. Macy? I, say, I, I feel like 50% kind of is a lot. So I mean, you're saying a bathroom, that's a really darn big bathroom if it's half the house. I mean, I think if you're doing 50% of the house, there's enough stuff coming in and out, there's going to be a lot of debris. I don't know. I mean, I don't. I questioned the 50% last time thinking it was maybe too small. <laughs> um, what if you're doing all the floors in your house? Doing all the floors? You know, if you're yeah. replacing your wood flooring, that'd be a renovation. Yeah. yeah. That'd be 100%. You have to fence it in. Well, so I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm curious to hear what he has to say. But well, I, I might want to do it because I wouldn't want my kids walking on the floors, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just to keep the children keep out. Keep them out. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Send them over to the Macy's or the Dubucks and then... Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but... Fine. I was just... I mean, he could, he could mean that any renovations would be exempted, but it would only be additions. I'm not sure. That would yeah. be another interpretation, too. So... But as Mr. Johnson said, we can uh, get clarification. I, I don't want to blow a big loophole in what I think is a pretty sound policy um, by you know, mucking it up too much, but I just want to make sure we're not overly burdening someone that's doing something relatively simple that doesn't really require metal fencing. Commissioner Lavasser. Uh, I, I agree with Commissioner DeBuck in this instance. Uh, uh, if... if uh, the renovations have nothing to do with the exterior of the property. There's, there's no reason to have a fence there, and uh, I would be inclined to want to clarify that in the ordinance so that uh, uh, if, if people are doing a major interior renovation, they don't feel compelled by the ordinance to put a fence up. Uh, certainly, if if we find that there is some problem and some little loophole that's popping up, we can address that uh, down the road. But I'd, I'd rather take the the position now that uh, we're not going to require the fence if if there's nothing exterior. And, and remember, we're talking about, you know, securing construction sites, right? So if the house is still locked and everything like that, and you're doing interior renovations, that's going to be my guess that it's secure. The doors are locked, you know. Um, just, I mean, think of why we changed it from the original one, because we said, hey, once the doors and windows and everything are in, then we can move down the fences. Well, if everything is locked and in the house and you know, then you wouldn't need fences. So I'm sure that's where the logic is and reasoning, but if we can make it clear and tie it up, that's, that'd be better. All right, so um, we'll bring it back for, s or actually we have a resolution in front of us, don't we? Um, I the guess- res the Resolution is to approve, approve the ordinance is submitted on first reading. Okay. Um, and if you want, you can do that, but we'll get clarification on this one issue before we bring it back for second reading. All right, Commissioner Dubuck. I'll move for passage on first reading. Motion by Commissioner Dubuck, uh, seconded by Commissioner Macy. Discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right, request to schedule goal setting special city commission meetings. Mr. Krizan. Yes, good evening, Mayor and City Commission. The administration is requesting that the city commission set this year's goal setting set goal setting special meetings. Uh, this might seem a little earlier than years past, but we are trying to be proactive proactive to help set the stage for the coming budget process. During the fall and the early winter, um, the finance department is doing essential tasks such as personnel costing and drafting the capital improvement plan, and these activities are uh, fairly dependent upon the completion of the goal setting sessions. So we are proposing an earlier start this year um, so that we can try and get these done before the end of the calendar year. The dates we are proposing right now are October 15th, November 17th, and December 3rd. Mr. Gibbs. 
I will be in Paris on November 17th, so um, maybe we can move it, bump it up a week to motion, the time. Motion to have the meeting in Paris. <laughs> oh, you have the meeting in Paris. I'm all for that, too. Wine, cheese. <laughs> And I will be in Italy on October 15th, so <laughs> that's out also. third meeting in Germany? I'll probably be at, you know, Whittier Park. I know we're all freezing, like, freezing myself to death watching <laughs> young athletes. Commissioner Pruch? And I'll be in Hawaii on December 3rd. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of lives do you lead? I, <laughs> That's pretty awesome. <laughs> so I've, I, I just, Kyle, you want to come over for a barbecue? <laughs> yes. We just have thoughts. such big salaries. We spend them on travel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, uh, Commissioner Douglas. But seriously, folks, I would like to propose a a new approach to our strategic planning, and that is that rather than tearing it all up and starting over every year we do our major strategic planning every two years at the introduction of a new commission. And that in the intervening years, which would be this year, we agree to retain the goals that we set as, as a, a full, as a new commission um, last year and address only objectives and tasks. Um, and that in the future, we, we follow that practice that so that in 2019, or you know, with a new commission, we go through and revisit all of our top level goals, um, but that we agree that what we agreed to nine months ago was still relevant to us, because as I think it is. And that might reduce, that would definitely reduce, I think, the number of uh, sessions that we need to address the subject matter. Commissioner Macy? I can see the efficiencies in doing it that way, but knowing what I know now about how I felt, how prepared I felt for the strategic planning this last year, um, I, I just feel like new commissioners would be at a severe disadvantage and might end up stuck with goals that they aren't really, they aren't really well equipped to um, champion for two years. So but you can answer one second. And I also want to say just about this, this seems much, much, much too early to me. We, we just did this. And I just, I feel like I'm not, I'm not ready, and I can't imagine that the departments that are going to be ready to be talking about what they need another full year and a half out, because that's what the that's what we're doing is strategic strategic planning for the 2019-2020. Um, so, I, 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 to me, this is just it's just too early. To, to be fair, Commissioner Macy, we did this last December, so we're only pulling it forward. You know, well, so this is months. different than strategic planning. No, this was strategic planning we did back in December. Typically, we do it in the winter. The, what we did was the budget planning sessions that were based oh, okay. on the strategic planning. So this is what we're using as the baseline for the finance department and everyone else to prepare the budget for the oh, upcoming okay. fiscal year. I was getting year. those mixed up. Yeah. I hear you now. Commissioner Dubuck. Um, I, but I still think Commissioner Macy has a point that if you just do it at the introduction of a new session, even the strategic planning, um, you go through it once and you have a bit of an experience and, and then a year of sitting at the table and you might have more clarity around the objectives that you want to put forward and actually how to get to putting them forward and actually how to build consensus to get other commissioners to agree that those should be strategic objectives. So I, I like visiting it reannually. I don't know that it needs to be torn up. We could still start from a working document, but I think it does need to be revisited because, um, for example, Everything happening in the city right now is going to be dramatically different one year from now uh, with regard to the Civic Center in Normandy Oaks. And once those things are done and free up bandwidth, other priorities can rise, and that's just in the course of a year. Uh, so I think it should be addressed. I really like the approach of doing it a little bit early so that it can be baked into the budget process because I think one of the tensions we've had is that we'll set these priorities uh, in January, you know, once, you know, I mean, that budget document takes a lot of time to put together, and we need staff to have time to digest and analyze our, our strategic goals so that, you know, they can determine the proper investments to make around those priorities. Um, so I, I like starting it early. I, I think this is a good approach. I, I do think that it does need to be fully revisited every year, although I appreciate, um, you know, the strategy and what uh, Commissioner Douglas is saying, but I think a full revisit is, is fair to commissioners and also allows us to, if, if something comes up, and, and, you know, we as residents are really, really concerned about something. We, we need to be able to uh, amend as necessary. Uh, the, my last note would be that um, I think this year it's, you know, totally appropriate if we can ever find dates that actually work for everybody um, to start in October. But I, I would think um, in 
future years, uh, in election years, the earliest you could start would be after the election so that you're not strategic planning for a commission that will not be, may not be the commission a few weeks later. Um, but otherwise, I really like the approach. I like moving this up a bit so that we have a, a budget that is more reflective of our agreed upon priorities. I would point out that when we originally set this up, we, we did actually even get it on the paper suggesting November 10th until it was pointed out to me by uh, my secretary that that's the Michigan State, uh, uh, Ohio, State. Ohio State game. So who cares? All is tough. <laughs> I care, but well, I don't care that Sorry, not Michigan. I'm Michigan going State. to Paris. Michigan I'm going State. to Paris oh, well, regardless. Then we, then <laughs> we, we, we have the votes at the table. Okay. <laughs> so who's playing November 17th? <laughs> should really check. If that's a bye week, then we should. I think that's Nebraska for MSU. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. MSU. Yeah, that's not going to fly either. <laughs> So while I don't uh, disagree with the early start, I mean, I do think that makes sense. I still feel like the approach we've taken where we tear this up, we bring in a consultant every year, we start from scratch, we tear all this up and start over, is not strategic. I mean, what we've been doing is really tactical planning on a very short-term basis. I think the goals that we set here are worthy long-term goals, um, and I would, I, I'm going to make my case for sticking with them and, and uh, agreeing to a more abbreviated process, retaining the goals that we have, and then revisiting the objectives and tasks. Commissioner Lavasser. I'm going, to, I'm going to agree with Commissioner Douglas that I don't believe there's enough value here for three separate meetings like this. Well, I'll just add, I mean, well, we saw what happened in the budget plan, and we all voted to not have you know, a third meeting, and then we all decided, well, not all of us, but a couple of us decided we wish we would have had that third meeting to discuss items. So I don't see any harm in scheduling the meetings. Just like in the budget planning process, we can always decide after the first or second one to cancel it. I think Commissioner Douglas brings up a, a good point. I think by the natural order of things, you know, we'll um, take a look at what we have, and, you know, we're not going to be reworking the entire strategy of the city every year, so I think the natural order th of things will just present itself to where we are just going to be tweaking, you know, what our uh, goals and objectives are. Um, and so I don't see any harm in putting the, the spots in the, in the calendar. Um, and if we uh, decide that we make great progress because we don't have to put as much work into it because we got a good plan already and we just need to make some refinements, then okay. Then, you know, we get December 3rd back and we can use that to, you know, do something else. So or we get October 15th back. Hmm? But I think, I think the earlier, though, um, I mean, I think giving at least staff an indication of how you know, a basic idea and maybe is better early on because they are doing a lot of planning and then you start to get into the holiday season. So, you know, December is, I don't say a wash, but, you know, a lot of stuff's going on in December with staff. So I think they like to, to create the plan to do the plan. But, I mean, this is what they're recommending based on their needs. Commissioner Macy. We're, we're not going to do these dates, though, because we just agreed that we can't all be here on all these dates, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it depends... Uh, I mean, what do we have? Italy, Paris. Oh, I have. Yeah, I could make a motion to just go there for all this. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so who has a who has a conflict October fifteenth? Me. Okay, you're going to be in Italy. Yep. Okay. For what date? So we know that October tenth through November first. Oh. For you. That's actually good. Idea. No apologies. October's terrible. Does anybody too. else have an issue? <laughs> On October 15th. October is terrible for me as well. Commissioner Dubuck. I, just, I think maybe we need to doodle it yeah. instead of trying to cross-reference calendars at the table. That might be a challenge considering all the luxurious travel. <laughs> <laughs> so many other people are enjoying. Gerard out. <laughs> I'm going to be in Madison Heights. I might go to Great Wolf Lodge this year. On October 16th, so that date's off for me. <laughs> All right, do you guys want to push this off and, and do a quick doodle? I mean, we'll have to come back with by the s next meeting mm -hmm. in September because you guys need to get the resources and everybody lined up, you know what I mean? So if it is going to be an October one, um, you know, it looks like we might be pushing it out to November. But let's do a doodle. We have to recognize that maybe not all of us can attend all the meetings. 
um, and we'll just have to manage from there. So, um, Commissioner Gibbs? Do you want us to put on the record, on the record, um, what days we're going to be gone so that that's... Well, I think we'll do the doodle. That way nobody oh, knows oh, right. to the, the toilet paper thing. your house or, you know, mess with your lawn furniture. Because well, well, that's but the first thought that came to mind. I mean, Commissioner Douglas has gone that long. We can have some fun. But a doodle <laughs> proposes specific dates. So if you want to work around the known travel dates that we've identified here, you do need to know what dates the three of us will be <clears throat> gone. Not on the record, though. Yeah, not on the record. Yeah, that's... Email James. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then they'll come up with the dates. Email who, James? Okay. Everybody has an issue, not just with these dates, but if you have any significant that. travel plans or plans to be absent or whatever, email um, Jim. Okay. And uh, that way he can work around those. He's a genius. He can do a Rubik's Cube in like three seconds. He can manage our, uh, our dates. All right. So no action tonight. Mr. Grazan will... Try to do the impossible. <laughs> All right. Y'all yeah, come to Paris. Paris, Texas? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Just wanted to make sure. Wine and cheese and <laughs> baguettes or barbecue. Pasta I always and red wine. Pasta, red wine, yes. <laughs> Authorization to mail informative letter regarding ballot proposals, item number 14. This cool. is Mr. That's Johnson. Mine. I just want to make sure that uh, you do want us to do this. We've been doing it for the last several elections, though it was not done uh, for the primary this year. Uh, but we're, we've had ballot proposals. We've been doing a letter, a very carefully drafted letter, uh, that is not uh, advocating either a yes or a no vote uh, uh, to inform the voters about the proposals that are on the ballot. Uh, this seems to have actually been useful, uh, particularly for charter amendment proposals that a lot of people were not aware of before until they got into the voting booth that the proposals were even on the ballot because it's not one that anybody campaigns for or against. Uh, Mr. Johnson, these letters, we usually run them by um, the Attorney General's office, right? Do we do a check to make sure they're not advocating? The Attorney, not the Attorney General. The Attorney, okay. <laughs> the General Attorney. The City Attorney. Correct. And yeah, we've already been looking over a draft, in fact. So. Commissioner Levasseur? I, I have a concern here because uh, even if it's not using expressed words of advocacy, uh, just the ch choice of what information to, to share is a form of politicking or can be a form of politicking to advocate for a position, even if, if you're not specifically saying vote for this or vote for that. And so uh, I, I, I don't know that I'm comfortable simply giving a blanket authority to send something out with, without knowing what facts are going to be shared with the public, what facts are going to be withheld from the public. Commissioner Macy? Do we have an opportunity to see the letter? I I mean, it looks like this is just saying go forth and write and send the letter, but do we have an, is there an opportunity to see the letter before it goes out? Via email, yes. Via actually bringing it back to a meeting, probably not, because it really should be in the mail prior to the next meeting. Commissioner Douglas? Apropos of our strategic planning, we have a goal that says... Um, to proactively promote meaningful, open, and respectful dialogue that ensures effective decision-making. We have an objective that says employ multiple media for sharing information with residents. We have an objective that says engage residents more effectively in city decision-making. I think this action clearly supports our strategic direction. Commissioner Pruch? And as I recall, one of the more recent letters that went out, it wasn't a whole lot more other than saying this is going to be on the ballot. Here's the language. This is this is the language. It was just a. It didn't say anything more than that. It was just a heads up. Uh, of, this is what's going to be on the ballot. There were no other facts related to it. There were no other issues. It was nothing like, well, if you live in a two hundred thousand dollar house, this is how much you're going to pay. Nothing. It was just. This is what is going to be on the ballot, and especially this year when the ballot in November is going to be so huge with state proposals, I don't see anything wrong with just giving the residents a heads up that this language is going to be on your ballot. 
period. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. Commissioner Gibbs? My recollection about the letters that we receive is the same as Commissioner Perusha's. I would like to see it, though, before it went out, whether it be by email or by presenting it to us. But at least by email, I, I would really appreciate being able to review it. We can get it out to you by email. In fact, I could probably get the draft version, but it's still an early draft version right now. Sure. Out as soon as tomorrow. Sure. Commissioner Dubuck. Yeah, I think that this has been a... A helpful tool for residents to, to raise awareness that there is something on the ballot that's going to impact them directly uh, one way or another and give folks an opportunity to see what the actual technical language is what's technically going to happen and uh, you know then go out and pursue more information as they will but definitely flagging it for residents I think has raised the profile of local initiatives which can get lost in the noise of a national election and we know there is a lot of noise around the national election so um, with the understanding that we have had a pretty solid track record of having very, very neutral, non-advocacy language, just saying what this is and that it's on the ballot. Um, I'll move to direct staff to prepare the letter with the caveat that it will be shared with all commissioners um, to solicit you know, feedback or concerns prior to sending. I have a motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Douglas. Discussion? Commissioner Lavasser. I, I appreciate the desire to get this out quickly, but we are back here on the 24th of the month, and uh, uh, we're, we're really not in a position where we can have an open discussion via email on this topic. Uh, I, I do believe it would be appropriate for a draft of the proposed letter to be submitted to us on the 24th. We can give it a yay or a nay at that time. Uh, I do agree that if we're simply saying this language is going to be on the ballot and that's about it, I, I wouldn't have a, a big problem with that. But... Um, uh, again, if it's going out shortly after the 24th, uh, that I believe would be plenty timely for al alerting the, uh, the the general public to the existence of these proposals, giving them opportunity to do, do their own vetting of the proposals. Commissioner Dubuck. Um, the city clerk, Ms. Loss, could you, when do you plan on uh, putting absentee ballots in the mail? Um, the first week of August, or October. First week of October. Yeah. So if we are approved on the 24th, is your concern, Mr. Johnson, the turnaround time for printing, stuffing, mailing? I'm sure we contract out for that. Yeah. I know it's a very busy time of year for print shops. So generally a seven-day turnaround and then a two-day delivery time is reasonable. So if we approve on the 24th and we pull the trigger on the 25th, it should be in mailboxes by the 1st, which is the day our absentee ballots are going in the mail. So we would hit a couple days before absentee ballots hit, which seems acceptable. That gives you heartburn, I see. It's pretty tight. It's tight. Um, but I would certainly like for this, I want everyone to be comfortable with moving forward with this kind of communication. I, you know, I think this should be something that we're all on board with, and I don't want to feel like anyone thinks that they're not getting a chance to review and approve the language. And I wouldn't want residents to think that we have any stake in advocating one way or another um, with public dollars on this. So I think it's better to be safe than sorry and perhaps bring the language back to us uh, at the meeting on the, the 24th for approval um, and maybe have a contractor, uh, a mailhouse queued up to pull the trigger on that yeah. right away. And, and I would just add that, you know, if we can take our um, responsibilities here and not wait till the 24th to give feedback, that if Mr. Johnson and staff get this letter out in the next day or so, you know, that we, by the end of the week, you know, provide our input that way, you know, whether you agree or disagree with the letter, they have a chance to update with some considerations here. But remember, the city attorney also has to do a comprehensive review and make sure that anything that we're recommending doesn't advocate and things of that nature. So to give staff the, the time to, if you're going to want to give, if we're going to want to give our feedback, we have to give them the time to incorporate that feedback or or not if it's, if it's advocating. So... Um, I think that's a commitment that we need to make here because if we get to the 24th and all of a sudden there's edits or whatever, I'm going to, you know, call shame on those who didn't provide their feedback um, well ahead of time. Uh, Commissioner Lavasse. I, I just want to make sure when, when you say feedback, we're talking about feedback specifically to staff and not to be shared with the rest of the commission, Correct. which I believe would be a problem with Bye. Email, say, Open hey, I, what's sack. this question? Oh, you know what? I don't like this word. Is there another word we can use? And then they'll take that collective feedback and, you know, give us a revised draft. You and You cannot be copying the rest of the commission. No, yeah, you yeah, can't. You yeah. Do that. You just reply once. The Open Meetings Act. All right. The, the, the other question I have is what's our anticipated expenditure for providing this information? Do you remember what that is, Judy? 
It's usually around, I think it's around $10,000. It goes out. It goes out um, to every um, address in Royal Oak. We don't we don't go by like voter registration or anything. It's actually we discovered it's cheaper to just send it to every household using bulk mail as opposed to like it just goes out to resident, not voter. Not registered voters, every household. Every household gets it. Now 25,000. So even if the homeowner isn't registered, if they have a child that is or whatever. Commissioner Douglas? Yes, I, my recollection is a little bit different than the, that of Commissioner Perush and Gibbs. I do think in the past we have indicated the, uh, the typical effect on a home of a certain value, and I think that's relevant. I mean, that's yeah. dollar, uh, dollars and cents questions that people shouldn't have to sit down and, and figure out the millage rate and the SEV of their home to reach that conclusion. I think I, I, yeah, I remember that as well. Because we put the mill, and okay, what does that mean? What's a mill mean? Right. Well, okay, if the average house in Royal Oak is assessed at this, it would mean this amount to the average household per year, which is an important decision factor. Are you getting your, your value for what you're voting for? Yeah. And I'll also say, I got to tell you, um, you know, campaign season, knocking on doors, you know, before an election, I can tell you on three occasions someone brought the letter to me and said, what is this? about I appreciate it and some people still said well I'm gonna vote no for this and some people said I'm gonna vote yes for this so it was very helpful they said you hear things on Facebook you see art you're not really sure you know what exactly is going on and it's helpful to have something that I can prepare for because especially <laughs> with the charter amendments a lot of those really just don't get the attention because they're more I don't want to say formalities but we're trying to get our charter in compliance with um, state law but on some of these, you know, what does it mean? There's, there's, there's often noise out there, and you know, uh, it's good to have an unbiased letter that doesn't advocate for anything that that says, okay, this is what it is, this is what it will do, and this is what it will cost. Um, it's very helpful for people to go in and make a decision. Commissioner Dubuck. Right, so the motion on the table is for the proposal is put forward. I know we're talking about email feedback now. I just want to get consent or folks comfortable with being able to provide feedback directly to staff to get this out on a timetable that staff is more comfortable with. Are we okay with that? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the motion. Are we, we're okay. simply asking staff to draft the letter and then share it to us, but we're not authorizing it to go out yet? Uh, authority, the authorization will require another meeting, so it require the 24th. So I, I, what I'm saying is I can withdraw my motion to, to move us forward today and uh, you know, offer up a new motion, I guess. Commissioner Dubuck, do you withdraw your motion? I withdraw my motion. Commissioner Douglas? Actually, it belongs to the table, so if everyone agrees. Was there a second? Yeah, I think. Did I second that? You did. Yeah. You did. Yes. But nevertheless, it's not our, Kyle's right. on my does decision. Everyone, does anyone? It's, anyone object? Mm -mm. Okay, it's been withdrawn. So, Commissioner Dubuck, would you like to make a new motion? Sure. I'll move to direct staff to prepare the letter, supply it uh, to the commission for feedback and suggestions to be approved at the October 24th meeting. September, September. So, oh, geez, how about September instead of <laughs> October? September 24th. All right, we have a second by Commissioner Douglas. All right, discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right, that brings us to the end of our agenda. Notwithstanding anything else for the betterment of our fantastic community, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Commissioner Douglas. Mayor, the, the people's business being concluded for the evening, I move we adjourn. We have a motion by Commissioner Douglas, support by, second by Commissioner Macy. Any lengthy discussion on this topic? Uh, all right, with that, I'll call for a roll call vote. No, I'm just kidding. With that, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Uh, motion passes. We are adjourned. Oh,